Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. I love how cheerful and enthusiastic this audience always is. Um, welcome back to our um, exciting second presentation. And I would like to begin um, again, as always, by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral lands of the Gabrielli and Tongva peoples. We acknowledge their presence as its original caretakers and stewards. Welcome back to our second presentation. Um, let me introduce um, our first, our second artist. Um, before I do so, also I want to remind you that George Carlson's book, and George won, of course, um, no more than two awards at this year's Masters, both Best in Show and the Thomas Moran Memorial Award for Painting, um, is available in the gift store. And um, I believe there are several signed copies left, so um, don't miss out on that. Uh, John Moyers. Um, grew up in a very artistic household in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where his father, the sculptor and painter Bill Moyers, was his first influence. As a child, John experimented with clay, charcoal, indie ink, and watercolors before eventually settling on acrylics and oils. After high school, John was invited to live in Laguna Beach with one of his father's art teachers, a talented painter who opened his eyes to the world of art while he attended classes at Laguna Beach Art School and Saddleback Junior College. In 1979, he was invited by the artist Robert Lougheed to paint at the Okanagan Game Farm in British Columbia, where he met fellow artist Terry Kelly, and they have been married since 1982. So I think that means you guys are celebrating 40 years, right? Wow, that was impressive. Both Terry and Kelly see, or Terry and Kelly, Terry and John, see the outdoors as their studio and together they have traveled and painted all over the world. During John's 40 year career, he has won many, many awards, some of them considered the most prestigious in the Western art world. In 2003, he received appropriately the Robert Lowhey Memorial Award at the Prix de West. He is a seven time winner of the Cowboy Artists of America. Um, Best in Show Award, and he has received numerous gold and silver awards in oil um, and in water-soluble media at their annual exhibition and sale. In 2017, he won the James R. Parks Trustees Purchase Award for the Elder's Walk here at the Masters of the American West, and at the Idle Jorg, the Purchase Award for the Way to Sacred Water at the Quest for the West. His work is in many museum collections and private collections throughout the world, including this one. And he's been featured in um, all of the publications, I think, Art of the West, Southwest Art, Western Art and Architecture, and of course, Western Art Collector. And in 2021, he won the Director's Choice for Excellence for, Excellence for Vanguard of the Northern Plains at Prix de West. In conversation with John today is our longtime trustee and collector, um, Jim Ray, also co-chair of the Master's Committee and therefore officially my partner in crime. So thank you, Jim and, and John, and um, welcome. Thank you, Amy, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, John, welcome to This Is Your Life. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, when John and I spoke about, about his, uh, his upbringing and career, he, he explained sadly that he doesn't have a lot of images from his, his younger years. <laughs> Uh, but I would like, John, why don't we begin with uh, your talking about your early career as a squirrel fan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And when I was a little kid, um, any free moment I had, I went lizard hunting and squirrel hunting and all this stuff. So I always had pets around the house, like squirrels and lizards, snakes. Um, my parents were very patient. <clears throat> but uh, um, yeah, I was always bringing stuff home, but this was Chipper. And I found Chipper under a lawn chair and brought <laughs> Chipper home. And, and Chipper had Chipper for like six or seven years. Wow. And, yeah, and Chipper was very tame. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, so beginning with your father, and we're going to get into that, you were surrounded by many very impressive and famous and powerful artists. So let's, let's talk about some of the influences in, uh, in your early years. Yeah, the, this is a painting Bob, by Bob Kuhn, which we own, and it's really beautiful. But um, 
Uh, when I was a kid, you know, um, I discovered Bob Coon. I, I used to get Outdoor Life, Sports of Field, all those uh, hunting and fishing magazines. And um, I really looked forward to getting them every month because of the, uh, the illustrations. And, and Bob Coon was, of course, my favorite. And uh, and I kind of was around Bob Coon a little bit growing up because my dad and him were pretty good friends. So, uh, um yeah, he was just like when I was growing up, he was probably my my hero. I mean, my main hero in the art world because he was so good. But I used to go to the library and study the sports of fields and outdoor lifes and everything. And and uh, so he was a major influence. And and this this uh, painting was done by John Clymer, who was a great guy too. And he um, was so nice to Terry and I. But uh, John Clymer painted this from life of, of Robert Lahey painting up around the Tetons somewhere. And so that's another one we own. And that one's pretty special to us because of who painted it and who's painting. So anyway. Yeah. So your father was the, the acclaimed William Warrior, uh, 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 illustrator, painter, sculptor. Yeah. About growing up with your father and how that contributed to your talent? So my father, yeah, he started out, his first art job he had, he worked at Disney Studios. He worked on Fantasia and Bambi. And then he left there and he went back to New York City and he started illustrating and he was doing Western books and he was kind of getting a lot of jobs doing uh, ink work for uh, Western books and so um uh then the war broke out he joined the army went to the philippines and everything came back and then he illustrated for uh oh for till the early 60s and uh, during so i was born in 58 so during the time i was growing up he had all this ink and watercolors gouache all this stuff laying around and and uh, I could use anything I wanted. He didn't care. So um, so I was always messing around with, with uh, you know, drawing and painting and stuff. So, um, yeah. So here's here's a couple of his paintings that he did. This one would, would have been done in the early 60s. And that one's 1979. But I posed for that one. So <laughs> that's me. That's you. Yep. Okay. So what have we got here? And then this was um, one of his sculptures that uh, is just, it's always been one of my favorites, even though it's very simple, but the old cowboy stand in there with the branding iron. And then this is one of his, uh, he used to do warm up drawings every morning because he would do these indie ink drawings and he wouldn't even draw them in with pencil. So every morning to get warmed up, he would do something like this. So that's one, he did that in 1945, but that's one he just did warming up in the morning. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, just, he was, that was his talent, you know, he could just do that stuff real loose. And, and uh, so anyway. He was a sculptor too. Yep. Yep, that's, that's one of his. Yeah, so he, but he, he uh, did, he usually did two sculptures every year, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he, uh, but you know, he, oh my gosh, the, I, I was just telling these girls here yesterday that um, I I don't think I'm ever going to be a sculptor because when when my brothers and I were young, we had to carry all these sculptures around all over the place, and, and it's, it's hard work, yeah. <laughs> So you you were fortunate to be uh, to be surrounded by many uh, yeah this highly acclaimed artists uh, Noel Tucker yeah Noel Tucker he was a super guy and he when he was one of my dad's teachers when my dad was young and so and he was a really good artist he trained at the Chicago Art Institute and um, he had great teachers but anyway when he when he was like I think he was in his early seventies and I was looking for an art school and he said uh, he said why don't we have John come out live with me and uh, 
I'll get him going on this whole deal. So the first year I was in California, I lived with Noel Tucker, and he was such a great guy, but he would set up still lives for me, and, and he really taught me a lot about painting. But this is just one a palette knife, little palette knife scene he did that with palette scrapings because he'd already painted something else. So he knocked this one out with a palette knife and we, we own that one and it's pretty cool. So, but anyway. Yeah. So one of the most important influences in your life, uh, in your artistic life is Robert Lockheed. Yeah, yeah. He, Tell us about him. He um, is my biggest influence. And when I was, you know, in high school, my dad um, called him and said, I've got this knucklehead kid that wants to be an artist, and can I bring him up and, and, and you have a talk with him? So we went up there, and uh, I, did, I didn't even realize that artists worked from life and from in the outdoors and stuff. And I didn't even, because my dad always did everything out of his head and everything. So um, we went up there, and uh, Bob got me going on outdoor painting and that was 1976 and that changed my whole life and so a month later he said I'd like you to go out and paint at least one a day and so I I did I painted one a day and went back a month later with 30 paintings and he couldn't believe it because he says usually I tell young people that and <laughs> they come back with like five paintings or something but I came back with 30 paintings and so we're off to the races, you know, but but he really changed my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to talk about these guys? Oh, well, th these are um, all of Bob's work. And this is one he did um, up in Canada. He, he There was a period of, in his life where he was really painting well, this Canadian period, but which he hadn't even really known for. But this one he did when it was 16 below zero. And the day before it was 32 below zero, and the farmer wouldn't bring his horses out. He said, it's too cold. So he went back the next day and it was 16 below. So the farmer brought his horses out so he could paint them. And then, uh, but he was that kind of guy, he was crazy. But, um, <laughs> but that's a little, a uh, horse he bought for his nephew named Tony, Tony the Pony. And he bought the, his nephew that little pony so he could paint it. So, uh, but so the, and then this is the little Quebec village. I don't know which one, but all these he did from life, and they're just so darn good. But he, I'm, I've set up and painted next to many artists, but I've never seen a guy paint like this guy can paint. So, are these some more examples of his work? Yeah, these are. These are all his work. He did that one. He and John Clymer went to New Mexico in 1952, and he did that one of the Talpa Mission up near Taos. And about a month after he painted that, the thing collapsed. So, um, And then this one my dad owned. And so, I, you know, every time I went upstairs to see what my dad was working on, I walked by that one, and, you know, it was just, Really cool painting, and that's one of his Canadian paintings. But they're just beautiful. So, here's another name that a lot of people will recognize in this room. Oh yeah, so Terry and I both were, you know, really studied and were influenced by Carl Rungus. He, he just, uh, he just was a great painter. Of course, Terry and I loved to paint up in Banff and Jasper, so. Um, every time we went up there to paint, we tried to get into the Glenbow Museum and see these little studies. These are all ones we own, but um, they're, they're just, uh, I mean, this guy knew how to paint. I, it went early on when I thought, well, you know, that guy, he kind of stylized a lot of that stuff, but the more I learned about painting, and the more I painted up in Canada, I thought, Wow, you know, what he painted was really there, like the, all those little temperature changes and, and the shadows and all that stuff. It's like he, he was really captured it, but I, didn't, I couldn't see it until I, I learned more about what I was looking at. But uh, yeah, very talented guy. And one, one final guy, Ned Jones. Yeah, 
Ned Jacob, of course, I knew Ned, or still know Ned, but um, always been, you to talk about, you know, another hero, this guy. Like, uh, again, when you, when you see him draw in person, it's like, wow, can that guy draw? But uh, this, this one, I saved up a bunch of money because I used to make jewelry and carve leather and make leather belts for people and stuff. So growing up, like in, I was a teenager and stuff, I would uh, um, I say, had this drawer full of money so <laughs> from all the stuff I was doing. So um, I saw that. I went into Finn Gallery when Forrest Finn still owned it. And, Ned exhibited there, and I saw that drawing, and I thought, God, that is the coolest thing I ever saw. So um, my dad called Forrest Finn up and said, um, I got this knucklehead kid that <laughs> wants a Ned Jacob drawing. And so Forrest Finn said, well, I got to pay Ned such and such amount. It wasn't that much back then. This was a long time ago. And I was like 17 or 18 years old. And so... He said he can if he just pays me what I have to pay Ned, he can have it. So I took my money up there and I got that drawing, and there it is. We still have that. But to, I mean, look how talented this guy. I mean, he's just so talented. Absolutely. No. So you're you're married to the equally talented and definitely not a knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And and you two got together. Uh, in, in Lockheed's arena. Yeah, so oh, okay. we, so in 1979, I'd gone to art school out here in California a couple of years. And so Noel Tucker, he said, you know what? He says, you got to, I mean, you got all you're going to get out of art school. He says, you got to go back and study with Lockheed and study with Tom Lovell and those guys. Because I had the opportunity. I knew him, you know. And so, uh, so I did. I quit school and and I went back to New Mexico, and which is the smartest thing I ever did in my life, besides Mary Terry. <laughs> so, but uh, um, anyway, so we, um, so I went back, and Bob Bahid said, "Why don't you join us this fall up in British Columbia at this game farm? And you were just—it's not a workshop or anything. You just go up there and paint all day, and for a month." And uh, so anyway, I went up there, and and uh, and a friend of mine went with me from a uh, friend of mine from Hawaii, and uh, we went up there. And we thought we were real, you know, hot shots because we've been to art school and everything. And so, and I kept telling Russ, I said, these guys up here, they're not even going to be able to draw, you know. And so, we first day we got there, we drove around, and there was Terry, and she had this panel up on her. Uh, uh, French easel and and it was these grizzly bears in all these different positions and we both like our jaws dropped because we hadn't seen anybody draw like that and that was Terry and that's my first memory of Terry was those darn drawings so <laughs> that put us in our place real fast so yeah good for you Terry yeah okay um what have we got here? These are some of Terry's paintings up in, from up at uh, Lake O'Hara, Lake O'Hara. And, is that Valley of the Ten Peaks? Yeah. So up in Banff, and we used to own a place up there on the Banff Park border, and so we painted up there a lot for years. And um, we're not even really known for that stuff, but we did it because it was it was fun and it was great practice. You know, but uh, um, yeah, great, great. We're gonna go paint up there this fall, actually. And I think these so, last two are a couple of chairs as well. Yeah, this is um, in Europe. This is in uh, uh, Cornwall, Cornwall, and the tide went out, and this boat was. The, the tide changes there are amazing, but this boat just was sitting there, and it's so cool. But Terry did that one, and that's Hawaii, and that's Hawaii. But, uh, yeah. So you guys are notorious for traveling the world and painting in plein air. 
Yeah. And um, let's let's talk about some of those adventures. Yeah, the the one that you just had up here before. That right there. Yeah, that's Ronda, Spain, and I love painting in Spain. This is probably my well, Venice and Spain are my two favorite places, but there's so much in Spain. Um, but anyway, that's Ronda, and that's an old aqueduct. That the I think the Romans built that, right? It's the they call it the new bridge. Yeah. The old bridge is Roman. This is I'm not sure if this is Roman. I think it is. is. But anyway, it's but you had to you had to you had to hike down this trail down the bottom of the hill. And then look up at it. So the but it was like, oh my gosh, such a great place to paint. How about Canada? Okay, this is uh, both. Of, well, that's like MacArthur, and that's me painting that painting. So that's done the finished painting. But we used to like. Uh, I mean, we just spent a lot of time painting up in that area, and it's just uh, it's just. Beautiful. I mean, the colors and the light up there is spectacular. So, you know, that's, I guess, as a outdoor painter, you're always looking for those places where the light's good. And this is, and Canada is one of those places where the light's really good. Spain's really got, got has really great light. So, of course, everybody knows that to create a masterpiece, you've got to be able to engage in a uh, icicle while you're painting. <laughs> so that's that's on the Alberta Saskatchewan border, and it was it's so hot there in the summer, and that, it was like 110 degrees or something. And a friend of ours, there was this little gas station or something up the road because you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing around. But anyway, this gas station had popsicles, so he went up and surprised us with popsicles. So, the, And I had to paint while I was eating it because the light was going, a slight light, and the, and the popsicles melt. And so I was, man, I did it. It was a juggling act. But I, you either lose the light or you lose the popsicles. Yeah, so, but I, I got it done. But this, this is Terry and I, and this is one of Terry's favorite spots to paint, Victoria Falls. And there she is showing off again. <laughs> But that, that's a neat little painting. Yeah. So sometimes it's hot when you're painting, sometimes it's cold. Yeah, this was, uh, we were up at Lake O'Hara and it snowed that night. And it was like, um, I think it snowed 16 inches on top of snow. We were going to paint at Lake MacArthur that day. And it's, it's a 45 minute hike if you're going pretty fast on dry ground. But we broke trail and we got in there and and we painted there all day, but then when that sun went down, oh my God, it got cold. So that painting there that I'm working on, that's funny because it looks like, a, it's like, what the heck is John doing with that dark background? But um, if you saw the finished painting, it was, a, it was a dark gray gesso board, and I left a lot of that showing through but the whole painting is actually you know the values you see in the background behind me i covered all that right now it's not covered so but that's so are, yeah are these from that ex ex expedition well these are we've painted there so many times yeah. that i don't know which ones they're from but this is uh that's on the way to lake oisa lake o'hara and lake macarthur but lake macarthur is i guess my favorite place up there but i've painted there for like 10 years and I thought, man, I'm not painted a good painting here. And it, it uh, so I wanted to keep going back till I could finally paint a good painting. And um, it took me like 10 years. But anyway, I finally got one done. But, um, but anyways, this, this country's great. Yeah. Persistence pays off. Yeah. And then uh, that's uh, Lake MacArthur again. And, Lake O'Hara. One of your favorite places, Hawaii. You guys yeah. go there every year? Yeah, we go, we try to go once or twice a year. Of course, COVID kind of slowed us down a little there, but um, this, I just painted these two about two or three weeks ago. We were just there painting. So a lot of times I finish first, and so I paint one real fast just for fun and that's these palm trees i just knocked that out really fast just with what i had on my palette and just had fun with it so 
um, again on a tone board and left a lot of it showing through. The, um, Hannah, the painter, she was with us and uh, she did a good job. What he's trying to say is that we are slower. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, it's all fun. This one I just did on that trip too. These, uh, um, I mean, the, the painting's a little, little different than what you're seeing here. They're kind of washed out here, but this is a, a place we like to paint. It's kind of quiet there. There's not too many people around, but on the big island. We've got a little bit of a special treat here. This is uh, John and Terry at work in Hawaii. Yeah, we paid this turtle $100 to show up at a certain time. <laughs> And uh, he did, he showed up. So, so there I am painting. And Johnson, uh, Josh did the videography on this. Yeah, there's Terry. So yeah, we're just knocking in some paintings here. Uh, this one is, I guess, more close, it's, well, it's probably about two thirds done. But, um, again, the color is not true on what we're seeing there. But um, yeah, and there's like here's Terry painting some more. But uh, you can kind of see we just uh, um, set up and find places we like and just set up and paint. You have to when you paint outdoors. You know you you have to look like look 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 look, and uh, so that's what we're doing there. We're just constantly looking. And there it is. Yeah, there's mine. It's about, I couldn't do any more damage to it, so I put it away. But uh, it's yeah. Where you can get that second one in before I finish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this one, th now this day we we're down at South Point, which is the southernmost place in the United States. And it's always windy down there. So you can see me holding my my uh, easel and, and Terry holding hers too, because if you don't hold them, they blow oh, over. Right over. <laughs> yeah, so we're down there painting. And, um, and there I am just drawing it in, you know, just trying to, I guess when when I paint these things, I try to kind of establish patterns with my drawing, like where, so that I start laying in some patterns. And um, I guess I've always kind of uh, thinking patterns more than anything else. So. so you see me looking all around. I'm looking for a wave. At that point, I was looking for a wave. It was matched what I drew in, and then sometimes you can't find that again, or you have to look around and find another one. So these waves are changing all the time. So you're looking around trying to find a piece there and a piece there. And um, is that the back of Hannah's head there? Yeah, there's Hannah. <laughs> well, that's I don't know. Is that that's, you. that's me? And then um, anyway, we were set up and and painting and um, Hannah's been studying with us on and off for like 10 years now. And she's, uh, she's pretty good. What I like about Hannah and her friend Claire, they can both draw really well, which is the name of the game. You know, if you can draw, it's uh, the painting's almost the easy part. So they're both really good draftsmen. And here's Hannah painting. So I'm trying to figure out what I can copy off her painting <laughs> and, and apply it to mine. So, yeah. Anyway, there's Terry. This was kind of a tough one because we um set up and everything we thought the light was going to be pretty consistent and then it changed of course and um so we're kind of mucking around because we should have quit painting but josh was filming and we thought well but uh anyway but it was fun that's the that's the problem with painting outdoors you know 
things change. It's out of your control. So, yep. you know. So you mentioned earlier that one of your favorite locations is Europe. Yeah. Uh, you travel over there pretty regularly. Let's, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we've been going over there. We wish we could go more. And, of course, COVID kind of slowed us down with that, too. But that's Kurt Walters. And his pants weren't that blue. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that's Kurt. And we've traveled a lot of places with Kurt Walters and Tom Daly, and they're super nice guys. But uh, we travel well together. We like they go off, and Kurt goes off and paints whatever he wants to paint, and we paint, and then we meet for dinner. And yeah, it works good. And that's uh, not my leopard skin suitcase over there. <laughs> it is awesome. I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, we bought that in London because we bought too many books or something, so we bought the cheapest suitcase we could get, and there it is. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think a couple of years ago, we were all headed over there for Kurt's birthday, and then COVID hit and destroyed Yeah, we were gonna paint, we're, we were going to paint with Kurt and go from there to Venice and everything. But those, So then, uh, I don't know, not after 9-11 and all that, we decided, you know, um, it was kind of hard to travel with all this oil paints and wet paintings and all this stuff. So we started, I thought, man, I'm going to start doing watercolors again because that's what I grew up doing. So I started, both Terry and I started traveling with watercolors, and we've done a lot of watercolors in Europe and Hawaii, and they're, they're actually really fun, and they actually make my studio work better because watercolors man if you can't draw it in right then you're in trouble right off the bat so really makes you like oil paintings i have to always remind myself to just get it right first don't think you're going to go back and, and fix it later you know because you're lazy to fix it right off the bat so the watercolors you you can't you have to they have to be drawn well right off the bat and everything has it really makes you think so you can't fix it yeah and that and these are like uh, there might be some opaque stuff in there but most of it's transparent so those are oils though over there yeah that's an oil and that's me painting that picture but that's a in Gr granada spain okay this is in venice again watercolors these are pretty big watercolors. They're like quarter sheet, and they're um, they're just fun. I just enjoy doing them. But you really have to think. But it was funny when I did those arches. I tried drawing them in freehand. I couldn't get them to work right. So I found the bottom of a can or something laying around, and I so I did the arch, the round arch parts by tracing around the edge of that can, and it worked. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, anything, anything it takes to make a picture, right? There you go. Yeah. So, and here's the yeah, again stuff I did in Venice. That's uh, oh, um, the piazza. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the Doge's part of the Doge's, Doge's palace. palace yeah. yeah, and those, like that's not bad drawing, but the the. <laughs> The, each post is a little different, and then the one at the end is real different. So it's like it's not like, oh my God, that guy can't draw a post. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but anyway, and this one was fun. I, I I've always been attracted to stuff that's a major challenge. You know, like I always pick stuff that's too hard, but I really enjoy, you know, trying to tackle stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And this is we. Took a boat ride over to another island across. Oh, what's the name of it? Cross from, from the lagoon. Yeah. Uh, that's right. But anyway, um, yeah, it's just one of the, it was kind of a stormy sky and stuff, and I just, you know, had fun doing that. But it's, I just like doing that stuff. So, um, yeah, more, this is uh, northern Spain. This is, um, although you can't tell, but this was up in the mountains, and there was just this neat little town where all the little trails walking through and stuff. And, um, and it takes me like a week or two to get really warmed up to where I'm painting well. And so by this point, I think I was, you know, 
painting pretty well. But and this is in Spain, northern Spain. That's in northern Spain. Just look at this stuff. The subject matter is so great, you know. Here you are, partners in crime. Yeah, this is. Is that French? Or was that? Oh, that's Rhonda. That's up on top. Oh, that's Rhonda. Yeah. So that's a that's a great place to paint. Rhonda is kind of this little mountain town in southern Spain, and it's just uh, we just stumbled into it. And there we'd seen some watercolors. In fact, I found this watercolor at an antique mall years ago in Pasadena. Uh, a, it was done by a British watercolors, but it was um, of Rhonda of those aqueducts there. So. I thought, man, I wonder where he painted that. Because um, anyway, we figured it out, and that's why we went down there and painted. But it's a great place, yeah. But the British, those watercolors from Britain, they went into this area a lot and painted, like in the 1900, 1910, 1920. So, so do you get an audience when you're when you're in a place like this and you <laughs> set up with your easel and? Um, no, because. Um, Terry can be rude, and so they kind of <laughs> they, they, they kind of stay clear of us. Well, hear your rebuttal after the presentation. <laughs> no, actually, she's nice, and I say don't talk to them because I I just once I start painting, I don't want to talk to anybody. But anyway, this is in uh, this is in France. Yeah, so. It's, uh, I forget the name of it, but anyway, yeah, we're just painting and having fun, but yeah, that was, that was a good day. So, um, here I am. Oh, that's an oil because I'm drawing it in with oil paint, but, um, this, no, that's a different game. But anyway, I like paint these, uh, gates and doorways in Europe, but this one, um, was really fun and I like if I had tried to paint that subject early in the trip I couldn't have done it but I was really warmed up and it was tough because it was that light went fast but so I had to um, uh, figure out what area was going to change the, the um, was going to change first and then knock that in and then finish the stuff after the words. And but that one was especially hard because the shadows and where the sun was hitting, where the shadows were warm, and then where it was shady, they were cool and stuff. But um, that's that, to me, that's one of my most successful watercolors I've ever painted. Is there something yeah. about architectural subject matter that attracts you as a, as a subject? I just like it, because I think it's because it's hard. I like to paint it, or it's like if something, if I think something is, nothing's easy in painting, but if I think it's going to be too easy, then I kind of, I like painting hard stuff. So, but this is, uh, both these were done in Venice. And uh, yeah, it's just a great place to paint. Okay, let's move on and talk about uh, some of your career and some of your studio work. Yeah, this one um, was uh, called White Man's Leftovers, and I did that years ago. Well, what, I don't, can't read the date, but um, it was in one of the CA shows. But uh, you remember that little sketch where I was eating the popsicle? Yeah. That, this landscape in there was from the material I got from that trip. And uh, that's, in fact, that's what I was painting that day. I think I won Best in Show with that at the CA show one year with that. Painting. And uh, that one, I started, uh, I can't remember the year, and we're going to see the other painting, but I started doing these, well, I call them big head paintings. And um, I, we went to London, and I, we went to a, a show at the National Portrait Gallery in London, and it was a contemporary portrait show. And there was all these portraits of these huge heads and I thought wow this is cool because when I went to art school they said when you paint a portrait make the head a little smaller than the person you're painting or it look like they have a big head so <laughs> so anyway so I thought these guys went the whole nother direction and uh, so then I thought I'm going to apply that to what I'm doing so I started doing these paintings and um, yeah so but this is one of them 
<laughs> well, this is kind of a different uh, approach. Yeah, this is like, um, just kind of show my dad's influence and stuff. So this is a dry brush and ink drawing I did. And it was a big drawing. It was, I don't know, it was big. But anyway, that's, you know, um, I just think just for young artists, like drawing is so important. It's so important, yeah. So. So this is kind of a special one? Oh yeah, this one is the one that the Jim Parks um, Purchase Award. So this is one that uh, that I did in Santa Fe. I think this is one of the last paintings I did before we moved to California that I did in Santa Fe. It's just, that's what I like to paint. You know, I just, uh, after I went to Spain and I saw all those Soroya paintings there and stuff, and I, there, there was this artist that said, uh, oh, he told me, he said, John, he says, you know, you use white in your paintings as a crutch. And I thought, and I stood to, so then he started playing with my brain, you know, it's a crutch. So then I went to Spain and uh, um, I saw the Soroyas and I thought, nope, it's not a crutch, man. It's cool stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> but uh, the way Soroya painted white in his paintings is, but Noel Tucker told me, he says, if you're going to, uses a lot of these colors you like to use. You either have to have a lot of black in your painting or a lot of white, then your color's gonna work better. And, you know, so I've always been attracted to strong patterns and stuff, so. In fact, I was talking to Bo today, we were looking at your painting on the wall mm -hmm. in there, and you've got these these white accents on, on the faces. Mm -hmm. He said, any other artist trying to do that and completely blow it out, but with you, it works. Well, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so I just have fun. There's <laughs> indication that it works there. Yeah, there's uh, me getting that award. That was pretty, that one caught me off guard. Well, they all don't actually, but um, anyway, there I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay, congratulations. Okay, this is a painting. Um, I, I did two, sometimes I have to do two or three paintings because I, I do, I'll do one and I'm not happy with it. And I'll do another one, I'm not happy with it. So I did two um, paintings about the long walk where they rounded up the Navajos in I think 1864 and they made them walk down to Fort Sumner, New Mexico. And a lot of them died along the way. It was terrible what they did, but anyway, so, um, I wanted to do, I did one painting. I thought, no, I didn't get to feel it like the seriousness of this deal. So then I, I wanted to do a more somber painting. And so I did this one where like this old man, he's having trouble walking and the guy's reaching back to help him. But uh, that that painting I still own, but it's uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's to me it's an important do subject to tackle. With a, with a nocturne feel? Well, this one's not a nocturne. It's just almost dark, but not quite. But I used to do more, but I don't know. I kind of got bored with them, I guess. But that's just a personal thing, you know. I like light and bright patterns and stuff. So, but that's, I guess at this point in my career, that's about as dark as I'm going to go. So, okay. Well, yeah. We're back to the daylight here. So this is a painting I did a long time ago. It was about 40, 60, and it was just a one I was happy with because simple patterns, like I played the white horse, like they're, they're on snow, so I play the white horse against dark shapes. And, and you know, I'm just playing around with all this stuff against each other. But um, uh, yeah, that that was, uh, that was a fun one to paint. I kind of, it's very f rare that I paint a painting that, is as good as what I pictured it being. It's like, it's always like this disappointment, but um, sometimes you get it, you know, so. This one, there's a lot of emphasis on faces here. Uh, yeah, that one, uh, that one was called The Difference of Opinion. It was a great big painting. You know, I kind of was uh, playing around with uh, different whites and stuff, and of course made that figure the, the whitest blanket you know because i wanted him to be the center of attention but um god did that painting a long time ago too so but again uh when those mountains in new mexico when they get when the clouds cast shadow on them and then the foregrounds and sun sometimes they look black 
Although that's not black. I mean, when I painted it, but it gives the appearance of black. But. So uh, when people think about John Moyers, they often think about, you know, the kind of Tassanio Indian subject matter, but you'd like to play around with other subject matter as well. Yeah, I, I, I always say I do maybe one, maybe two cowboy paintings a year. This is one, and uh, it's called Hang and Rattle, but it's a cowboy. He's not, it's not going to end well, let's put it that way. But this one was funny because I thought the whole premise of this painting, besides wanting to do a bucking horse, was I thought, you know, I'm going to put the cows real low down in the in the painting, and that's going to give that horse height, you know. And that's what I did, and I think it worked. But anyway, it was it was kind of a fun one. That one won best to show at CA one year. Yeah, I love some of your vaquero subject matter, and I love the humor in this one. I think. Yeah, this is a gouache, which is a, a opaque watercolor, and this. Is if I could have one painting back that I've done in my life, it'd be this one. And not because it's a great painting or anything, but because of the subject. I love, like, I'm a snake guy. I love rattlesnakes and all that stuff. And, and I, in my whole childhood, I was catching this stuff and bringing, I even brought rattlesnakes home. My parents were very patient, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, uh, um, this is the, the name of this painting is called The Eagle and the Snake. And the eagle, like Pancho Villa referred to his uh, top soldiers as eagles. And then the, the Mexican flags, the eagle and the snake. So I came up with this idea and had uh, this, my buddy pose for me and everything. Um, and... I thought nobody in their right minds ever going to buy a painting of a rattlesnake, <laughs> and uh, it was very popular. In fact, I still get people asking me if I ever made prints of this painting. Like people loved it, and uh, and then that '95 Winchester, you know, I, I had all these people contacting me. It's like nobody ever puts a '95 Winchester in a painting. Nobody. Why did you do that? That's great. There's '95 Winchester clubs and all this stuff, and I didn't even know that. But that's the kind of rifle they would use during the Mexican Revolution. It was a very popular rifle, but that uh, that was a fun painting to do. Was the snake real? Uh, no. I mean, I painted it for, I don't even know. But uh, there's been plenty of rattlesnakes around the Moyers' house, that's for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, this one is one I just did a couple of years ago. But a um, bunch of Taos guys on horseback. And again, it's more about design and patterns than anything else. You know, that's just what I'm attracted to. But it's a pretty big painting. Speaking about patterns, there's plenty of patterns here. Yeah, this one's called Caught in the Open. It won best in show at, at um, CA, but this guy's out in the open. There's some Apaches that crested the hill, and so he's taken off. Because I've always been attracted to these um, vertical shapes, like whether it's aspen trees or whatever. And then when I was spending a lot of time in Arizona, I thought, God, I got to do something with saguaro cactuses, use those shapes the way I use aspens. And it took me like two or three years to figure out what I was going to do. And then I, I um, came up with this idea. And then I thought, well, the tendency would be to put the figure on that side of the painting so he has room to run out of there. But I thought, which would be, you know, that's like one of the rules that you're supposed to follow. But I thought, no, I'm putting him at this end, like he's closed in, putting those guys behind him. And I think it worked. So, but anyway, that was that was a fun one to paint. So. so this next painting was so wide that it technically broke the rules at Frida West. It was mm -hmm. wider than what was allowed. But they still went ahead and gave it a special special metal, and then Ann Phillips added it to her uh, yes. wonderful collection. Yeah. So tell us about this band. This one's called uh, Vanguard of the Northern Plains. And, I, you know, when we spent so much time up in Alberta and stuff, I, I started really studying those uh, Blackfeet tribes up there. And um, they, they're they really interesting, and they're very, you know, you talk about style, those guys 
understood style. I mean, they're, the way they dressed and looked and their way they did their hair and everything is pretty incredible. And look at the, the, uh, the masks on the horses and stuff. It's just really cool stuff. So this is a painting I wanted to do for years and years. And sometimes with me, I have to think about something. It might be 10 years I'm thinking about it before I, I uh, can actually tackle it. And this was one of those paintings that I kept thinking, how am I going to do it? Am I going to have them riding this way, that way? And I finally decided to have them riding straight at you. And uh, anyway, it was uh, it was uh, sometimes when you do these big involved paintings about halfway through, you think, oh, my God, you're so bored with it. You think, I can't paint this anymore. But this one was fun from start to finish. It was a fun one to paint. Yeah, in, in Josh's movie genre, this would look like it was painted in cinemascope. Yeah. Big wide angle. Yeah. Big wide so, angle thing. Yeah. So now we're back to the world of Pancho Villa. Yeah, this is a painting I did. It's called um, Tonight We Riot. And he's. I read this account where this guy was drawing battle plans in the in the dirt with his dagger, with his Mexican dagger. So I thought, man, that'd be a good painting. So. So uh, anyway, so I lined up all these models and posed all this stuff, and yeah, that that was that one's uh, in a museum somewhere. I can't even remember where, but anyway, this one I, I, I again I'm, I love patterns. I love old blankets. I, we have a pretty good collection of old blankets to pose models with and stuff, and so this is just. A, guy way up in the mountains in Colorado, like a Ute guy, and he's, you know, it's cold, but he's wrapped in that blanket. Again, I think my most successful paintings are very simple designs, you know, and um, this one's very simple. So if the one before this was Today That We Ride, I guess they're riding now. Yeah, this one, I thought I'm going to do a painting where, because I was doing all this Mexican Revolution stuff, and I thought I'm going to, you know, the, you, you again, talk about style, those old Charles in Mexico, man, they had style down, you know, their clothes and their sombreros and everything. They're just beautiful, their saddles. Everything was just top of the line. So this would have been like pre-revolution Mexican Charles, and they called this uh, Once We Were Kings, and that one best to show at the CA show. And uh, anyway, it's just a simple painting. I didn't even, it was one of the first paintings I ever did that I didn't put any landscape in. I thought, I don't need to do anything but paint the, the horses and the men and put some dust in there, but there's really no landscape. It's very simple, but um, yeah, that was a great big painting too. Yeah. But uh, I don't paint that big. Well, I just did that painting that Ann has, but um, <laughs> I know. I don't paint those big paintings like I used to. I used to do one after another after another. But, um, yeah, but that was a fun one. Just one every so often. Yeah. <laughs> Some people have got some big walls to cover. Yeah. So the thing that, that stands out in this one is just the festivity in it, which you don't tend to see. You don't tend to see that type of action in your no. work. What inspired you to go after that? Well, this yeah. one was, um, I read an account where they were, well, several accounts where they, the, during the Mexican Revolution, they'd go into these um, homes of wealthy people and, and steal everything. And so I thought, well, that'd be a kind of cool painting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then uh, again, had all these models pose, and it's quite a deal when we get all this going and we have stuff laying everything. And Terry and I have a huge collection of model clothes like we can dress a model pretty much any way we want and they're antique clothes or if i can't get them i'll have them made but um we have this collection of clothes and outfits and everything so we can do pretty much anything we want but um yeah so those guys or have that big iron chest with the lock still on it. So they're just going to take the whole chest and take deal with the lock later. The guy's stealing the European painting off the wall. But those wealthy Mexican families had a lot of stuff in their house from Europe. So I tried to reflect that, like the mar marble carving there and the European art and stuff. So anyway, they're 
it's not good what they're doing. <laughs> and then there's a broken vase on the floor. See pieces of it, but anyway. They're having a grand old time. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's definitely a story here. What's this all about? That was a great big painting too. I can't believe how big these were, but um, that one, he's begging for mercy. And I called that... Uh, the Judgment? The Judgment, yeah. The Judgment. And that that's, uh, to me, the most important part of that painting when I was painting it and when I posed models and everything were the hands. I had to get those hands right. And hopefully I did, but... Um, I was really struck by what you did with the headdress in, in this painting. Okay, this was my first big head painting. So I came back from London and I thought, oh, I've got to do that. So I did this. Oh, a long time ago. And I overheard a couple of CA guys, because I had it in the CA show, and I heard them say, do you think John's losing his mind? <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, so but, and I, maybe I was, who knows? But here I am still painting these things. But that was my first one. And, uh, and I called it the Eagle Bone Whistle. He's holding that Eagle Bone Whistle, so... Well, these two are completely different. Yeah. But, uh... So this one was, you know, it's just a, a Taos man and his daughters. And, you know, in early Taos, they were influenced by the Southern Plains fashion. And so this young lady's wearing a, a, like a Southern Plains dress. And it could have been made in Taos Pueblo or traded for, but they had, in fact, uh, Ann Phillips, uh, granddad, Bert Phillips, she just sold me a painting where it was a Taos man that Bert Phillips did, and he's wearing this Southern Plain shirt, so probably made in Taos Pueblo. But then this one over here was a funny one because uh, I I, we were going through Montana, and we stopped at the Custer Battlefield, and everywhere I look, somebody stuck these stickers on everything. Custer had it coming. So... Uh, and I thought, oh, my God, I've got to do a painting where it looks like they stuck a bumper sticker on my painting, you know. <laughs> so uh, so I did this painting because Custer kind of did have it coming. But anyway, <laughs> but we won't get into that. But, uh, so anyway, so I had uh, my number one son here. I said, how can we make a bumper sticker that's acid-free, that looks like a bumper sticker, da 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 and stick it on my painting. So I had, I'd had to do the painting in acrylic. So that's acrylic. And then I, um, uh, we made the sticker on canvas and then we glued it down with acrylic glue so it's acid free and it'll be there forever. But it's actually not painted on there, it's stuck on there. <laughs> and uh, so, and all the drawings behind I found some old, there's a book and they had some old uh, drawings, native done drawings of Custer's Last Stand, like their memories of it. So I put those in the background and Custer's standing up there in the top corner and his days or minutes are numbered. But anyway, that's what that is. So, so I guess we're going to look at a few big heads here. Yeah, this one I did... Uh, uh, you can't really tell because the, the, but this one I thought, oh, I'm going to paint the shadow really warm and then the light cold and see what I come up with. And so I kind of reversed everything as I went, but you know, I had fun doing it. But it was, if you saw the original, it turned out pretty cool. The, it's just kind of opposite of what your eye thinks it's going to be. So. Yeah. I love the facial expression on this guy. It almost seems like he's got a smirk or a look of disdain or something like that. So. Yeah. Well, it's just, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like, um, you know, th uh, that's one of the paintings I could say that I, I actually achieved what I was trying to achieve in this one. But it's just very simple and a simple design. And it just, it, Worked really well, but that's acrylic, and I, you know, that one was um, really fun to do. Bring it back, George Armstrong. Okay. <laughs> so I had this little phase in my life where I was doing all this Custer stuff, but I called this one uh, 
positive negative and that's like a negative piece of film or the right. negative for a film so i thought well so but it's a diptych and um that was hard to figure out and, and hannah was living with us and she because i'm like the stupidest person on the earth when it comes to computers and stuff so she was helping and josh was helping and and uh, anyway, I got it done, but it was it was because every everything was opposite. So the hat would have been like dark navy blue. So in in a negative, it would be you know white, and same with the jacket and everything. So, but it was fun. But it was really difficult. This one was easy. That one was hard. Did you have that at World War? <clears throat> yeah. 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 Okay. And then uh, the. This is another one, like talk about going back to the same place and because you can't paint it well and you finally, and so this is the old church at Trampas and I kept going back and I thought, what am I, I can't, like this is such a cool church and I can't get it right. And then so I thought, we went up there and I thought, oh, I'm gonna paint it straight on. I'm gonna paint it straight on and I did and I finally got one I liked and this is the one. So uh, yeah, I painted it straight on, and it just I think I think it works, and um, and then uh, that one up there I did uh, this little church north of Espanola. In fact, Hannah was with us, and um, but that that's kind of interesting. That, that the reason I put that one is not because it's a great painting or anything, but it's so important to work from life because even the cameras as great as they are today but this will show you like the if you took a photo of that the shadows like on each side of the church the shadow would be pretty much the same value and color and everything but um when you paint it from life the human eye can pick up those so this side of the church is so much warmer because there's reflected light kicking in that side of the church is a shadow there so it's cooler but that's little stuff like that you get from working from life you know so um and then this is another big head painting that i was just having fun with yeah i like the action in this one yeah, this is another Custer one, but uh, there's some, I don't know if you can tell, but there's some dead horses and cavalry soldiers and stuff up in, up in the grass up there. But then this guy's, you know, kind of, I don't know if you could, I guess it would be celebrating or, um, but anyway, I, I, again, I think this is one of my more successful pieces because it's simple, gets the point across and it's, uh, it was fun. And now for something completely different. Oh, yeah, this one uh, actually is in the collection of the Autry Museum. But I wanted to do um, a modern day idea. And, you know, this is when all that stuff was going on with the pipelines and this and that up, on the, up in um, the Midwest and everything. So Standing Rock. And uh, so I thought, oh, man, I got to do a a graffiti painting with the modern day man. So I called it modern man, but um, again, I had, it, I didn't want to make anything obvious. So I was running everything off. So you had to think about what you're reading, but- uh, No pipeline. Yeah. And, and so I, I studied and Googled and all this stuff like uh, in Native American graffiti and all this and so, I kind of made this hodgepodge of stuff. And then Josh said, holy cow, did you do that graffiti yourself? And I go, yeah. With a spray can, I go, yeah. And he goes, it looks like you knew what you were doing. And he says, Look, oh, he said, it looks like you'd done that before. And I go, yeah, maybe. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, anyway, but that says Custer had it coming up there in red. And anyway, I, that's, that's one of my favorite paintings I've ever done too. But this is another one of my big head paintings and it's big. And uh, I, I just did that a few months ago and it's still sitting in my studio because I got to figure out what I want to do with it. But um, I did that, this one and the littler one that's in the show. And um, I chose to put the littler one in the show because I have to make a living. 
And I don't, I don't think, I think this one would be tough to sell, but I'm still happy with it. So, yeah. a couple of more big heads. Yeah, yeah. So just you know, experimenting around with complementary colors and um, yeah. So again, they're big paintings, and it's just uh, um, I just have fun doing them. I, you know, can use big brushes which I love using big brushes and I can, you know, just have a lot of freedom with them. So the smaller the head, the tougher it is for me. The bigger the head, the easier it is. So. Well, thank you, John Warriors, for sharing with us your wonderful artistic talents. Oh, thank you. We'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions that uh, anyone in the audience may have. Raise your hand. Give me one second. Let me bring that. Yeah, let's bring the microphone to you yes. so it can be picked up on the on the videotape. Are these big heads posed from life? You have models. Do you put on the headdresses and the costumes? Yeah, we have models, and I have all the stuff, and I can dress a person any way I want. But you see, I used to do a lot of stuff from life in Santa Fe, but when we moved out to Los Angeles, I, didn't, I haven't found the models I need, although I think I just found one, a guy I think I can use. But So a lot of it's done from, like we'll travel to New Mexico and get models to pose and come back. But um, you know, you just have to do what you have to do to get it done. I wish I could paint them from life, but um, not right now unless I find somebody locally, so. And I have another question over here. Uh, hey, John, question for you. A lot of the large studio pieces that we got to enjoy and look at, you know, clearly very mm -hmm. detailed and take a tremendous amount of time, like when you had all those people in the scenes. But you guys clearly love doing so much plein air work and traveling and doing these little pieces. And I was curious if that's really because you really just enjoy it or if it's kind of exercising your art muscle or how those kind of fit together because it's so well, different. You mean, do I really enjoy doing the big pieces? Well, no, or? no, you, uh, traveling so much and doing the little oh, pieces that you do. So yeah, you we really we love doing that. In fact, uh, I always have threatened, I don't know who I'm threatening, I guess myself, but I always mm -hmm. threatened, uh, wouldn't it be cool to not even have a studio and just paint from life, you like go paint somewhere every day. And of course that's not realistic, but uh, that would be, that'd be so fun. But, um, but they, you know, um, I think Terry and I both view our outdoor work as practice, like not everything. I think that's one of the problems with a lot of, um, of the mentality today versus artists years and years ago. I think, uh, and hey, everybody, I mean, I'm guilty of it, but it's, uh, I think you think you, everything you paint has to be something for sale or something for a show because there's this deadline. That, But it's like, I think it's so important to practice and, you know, go draw at the zoo or go paint from life with, just to learn and that's so we still do that like we just were in Hawaii and we did a whole bunch of paintings and um then we just I just put up, have them in a pile in my studio you know I'm, I learned what I was going to learn and I'm on to other things but there it's just uh, we enjoy doing it and it's great practice so yeah. Hello, on. Hey, John, can you talk hey. a little bit about um, the kind of the heyday of the CA when at the time, it's my understanding, a lot of the work was really representational and, and uh, more traditional. Um, and with your addition to the CA, was were you being, leaning more contemporary and having a different vision from most of the other artists? Was, oh. it, was it well recepted or did it take time to get? I to think, get no, I, you know, it was, uh, I, um, when I got into the CA, it, it changed my life, you know, it was a very good thing. And um, uh, 
I all I mean, I think that uh um they're obviously very receptive to my work because they you know I did very well there and I um and I won several awards over the years that the artists voted on, you know, my show and everything. So so yeah, I was accepted, but then, you know, I knew, you know, I know when I'm stirring up trouble. So I knew some of my paintings I was going to put in there while I was walking a fine line, but that's always been the, I mean, I, 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 I also don't want to limit myself. If I can come up with a neat idea, I'm not going to, let um, a show or anything limit what I'm doing. Like I, I've put paintings in pre to West that you know that didn't make it through to the final show because of this, you know, subject matter and stuff. And so, um, uh, you know, I like taking chances. So, um, but CA was a really good thing for me, and the guys are still all my friends and everything. But it, it was a it was a good time in my life. How you doing? Good, thank you. Um, I did want to say thank you to some of the other um, people because they asked a few of the questions I already wanted to have answered. Um, so this is going to be a little more self serving. Um, what kind of advice could you give a young artist who's you know, kind of finding their own voice. Um, maybe I'd like to say you're a maverick, not to be too flattering, but, you know, kind of to that point of staying true to who you are and, you know, experimenting, going to Hawaii, painting Spain, yeah. things that aren't necessarily purely within this industry. Um, can you give any advice or kind of tell us a little bit about your journey to staying true to yourself as an artist? Well, I, th- you know, um, I was very fortunate because my dad was an artist, so... Um, I grew up, like, listening to him talk to other artists. You know, it's funny, a lot of the problems that happened when he was an artist are the same problems that we're all dealing with today. So um, I think it's, um, I think for a young artist, the one thing I can say, and these two will vouch for this, but learn how to draw that if you can learn how to draw that changes your whole life because then the better I can draw the like there's paintings I wanted to do I had great ideas when I was young but I didn't have the capability to do it so the better you can draw the neater neater ideas you can do so that's the most important thing as far as you know, the whole uh, gallery deal and going down that road, that's a minefield in itself. So, um, <laughs> but you know, but it's just, there's some great galleries and, and I think it's young artists today that Terry and I didn't have, they have Instagram now and Facebook. And so you can get your work out there where um, we couldn't back, the only way you could get your name out there when we started out was like, magazines and stuff we couldn't afford to buy an ad you know so it's um it's just it's like you're beating your head against the wall but nothing happens fast in the art world it's like slow motion every step of the way but um learn how to draw if you can draw i mean that opens a lot of eyes real fast when they see how well a person can draw so like ned jacob if if somebody came along that could draw like Ned Jacob, it was like you'd be an instant hit, you know. So, yeah, that's uh, hmm? a quick comment and then a question. Um, it amazes me for as long as you've been doing this that there is no, there's no such thing as a formulaic painting by John Moyers. No. The, the, mm-hmm. the ideas that you come up with um, of just endless variety, um, which is one of the things that I've always loved about your work. And the second is um, the landscapes have been a revelation in this presentation. I mean, those mm-hmm. are amazing. And this is really for, by the both of you. And so this is really a question for you both. Why is it that you have not taken that to the shows? Why have you not expanded oh, upon that? We have a little bit, but it's like, I like uh, if I can put three pieces in the show, then I want to put, um, I want to put, 
three best paintings I can put in the show are the, what, what I'm, uh, like what I want to put out there for people to see. And like I, the landscapes for me are really practice and reference. And I don't even remember the last time I used a photograph of a landscape in my paintings. Like when I put a landscape in my painting, it's from one of my sketches or something I've learned from my sketches. So, so uh, yeah, but uh, you know, w one time Terry and I had a landscape show in, in Tiger A Gallery and it was a huge success, but it was all Canadian paint, 25 years of Canadian landscapes that we just accumulated. But um, uh, yeah, so, I think like if I come to the Autry show, I want to, um, or the master show, I want to have, you know, what I think is what I'm doing, like what I'm excelling at at that point. And, and so the same with Terry, it's like, uh, um, you just, you just have to do what you, you want to put your best foot forward. And I think that's my figure work and historical work. And as far as, doing um, too many different things, that's always been a problem with me. <laughs> so I just like, I, lo I, love ex I love experimenting with materials too. I'm just all over the map with everything. So, yeah. I think that, oh, I was gonna say, I think that's all we have for today. Yeah, but we'll also, Sarah, two hands up. Yeah, we'll so I'm going to also start with this. Here. Real quick. Have you done any uh, portraits of Terry or self-portraits or contemporary portraits in this big head mode? Or is <laughs> no. that something you would ever want to do? <laughs> I think Terry would kill me if I did a big head of her. But anyway. <laughs> but no, I was like, uh, the last thing I want to do is do a self-portrait. It's like, it's like these wonderful... Native American faces are so beautiful. Why the heck would I want to paint this, you know? But anyway, so, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I, I just see what, sometimes I just wake up in the morning and say, what am I doing today? I just, maybe I'll wake up one morning and say, yeah, I'll paint a big head of Josh or something. I don't know. Yeah. One last question. Okay. Hi, John. So it's a comment. Uh, picking up on Amy's comment about your variety, which is, you know, really a great attraction to your art. The painting that you did last year that the Autry bought, I wanted to comment on. You're one of the few artists that's painting in the 21st century West. Mm -hmm. Too many, I think, Western artists paint the 19th century. Even their grandfathers weren't alive then. So I'd like to encourage you to do even more of that. And your question also, you know, think about painting what you're living. Because uh -huh. when history looks back at the 21st and the 20th century, they look at art. They don't yeah. look at anything else. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah. It, it, it's just um, the problem is, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of artists will tell you this too, it's like you're, like you're walking a fine line, like I used that saying a few minutes ago, but you have to make a living. And so um, it's... Uh, I've got so many ideas for contemporary Los Angeles and stuff, but I have to make a living. So, but I have some great ideas and, you know, I'm going to do some of them, but um, uh, it's just both Terry and I were sick for two or three years and we're finally getting back to where painting well again. And I, you know, I'm, I'm going to start tackling some stuff. I mean, I've been thinking about it, but uh you just, uh, nothing happens fast. So, yeah, you got to prepare, be mentally prepared. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you.